We are on the tail end of our series, Rise and Fall. It is a leadership series. It is a series we're in. We are looking at the, the qualifications, the qualities of a leader who are worth following. And hopefully, we will be able to imbibe or at least be inspired to be leaders who are going to be worth follow, following as well. And we saw from the first week, we've been look, talking about this for the, for the past four weeks, and we, we saw that um, from the first week, we've seen that Leadership is not just about the position. You remember Abimelech on the first week, wherein he wanted the position of a leader, wanted the position of a king, even if God did not choose him. And we realize that you can be a leader, even without the position, even without the title. Because as followers of Jesus, we are all called to lead. But the way that Jesus calls us to lead is to serve. We've talked about personal sacrifice in the first week. On the second week, we've talked about Saul. Saul being a man chosen by the Lord. But then, however, uh, as, as, he, as he progressed in his king, kingship, something happened. Instead of giving the glory to God, instead of building monuments and altars to the Lord, there came a point in his life wherein he was building a monument for, him, for himself. And we saw that leaders should always, always have this understanding that God is the one who gets the glory. And then we, we, we looked at King David, one of the greatest kings of Israel. The one who, who uh, so to speak, militarily uh, conquered the neighboring uh, kingdoms around Israel and, and gave, mili- um, what do you call this, peace and order gave stability in terms of politics to Israel. And we saw that, you know, just a a, a simple thing, just because he was not on the right place, where he was not where God has called him to be, just like that O-ring in the the space shuttle Challenger, no matter how small that part may be, if it's not functioning well, it will in the little things that we neglect lead to the big mistakes in our lives. And last week, we talked about Solomon. And, you know, Solomon, wow, economically, Israel was booming. If you put um, the, the, the economy of Israel to our economy today, if, say, for example, Solomon is the president of the Philippines today, and we're experiencing what, what Israel experienced, it's like the dollar, the dollar exchange is what? One is to 45, 47? 47. One is to 47. Imagine the dollar exchange is one is to 100, but it's one peso to $100. That's how prosperous Israel was during that time. Silver was as common as stone. If you're a single professional and you're courting someone and you give her silver, you know, give her a gift of silver bracelet, silver jewelry. She's going to look at you and, 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 and ask you, do you think I'm cheap for giving me silver, which is as common as stone during the time of Solomon? But we saw that because of pride, as Pastor Joseph was the one who preached here yet, uh, last week, because of pride, Solomon was not able to recover from his downfall. And today, we're going to look at in the book of 2 Kings, chapter 20, verse 1 to 6, another king, King Hezekiah. And if you have your Bibles with you, please do read with me in 2 Kings, chapter 20, verse 1 to 6. If I may ask us to stand just in, you know, to honor the word of the Lord. Thank you. Let me read that for you. In those days, Hezekiah became sick and was at the point of death. And Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amos, came to him and said to him, Thus says the Lord, Set your house in order, for you shall die, you shall not recover. Then Hezekiah turned his face to the wall and prayed to the Lord, saying, Now, O Lord, please remember how I have walked before you in faithfulness and with a whole heart, and have done what is good in your sight. And Isaiah and Hezekiah wept bitterly. And before Isaiah had gone out of the middle of the court, the word of the Lord came to him. Turn back and say to Hezekiah, the leader of my people, Thus says the Lord, the God of David your father, I have heard your prayer. I have seen your tears. Behold, I will heal you. On the third day you shall go up to the house of the Lord. Father, we thank you for your word. 
We thank you, Lord God, for your goodness and your faithfulness to your people. And God, we ask for your Holy Spirit to open our hearts and our minds to receive your truth and have the faith, Lord God, to trust you that you will supply the grace so that we can walk in your truth with regards to uh, our calling as leaders, as our calling as people who will, whom you have given a platform of influence, whether that's a mom, a dad, whether that's in our marriages, in our offices, with our friends, Lord God, we, we ask that we will continue to honor you and glorify you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Please do take your seat. Let me just give you a background of Hezekiah. You can read his, his story from 2 Kings chapter, I believe, chapter 16. He is the son of Ahaz. Ahaz is uh, one of the wicked kings of Judah. Okay, so during the time of, during his time also, the prophet Isaiah was ministering. And Isaiah actually ministered during the times of four kings. Well, he was born during the time of, of Uzziah, but when Uzziah was dying, it's the time that God has given him his calling. Well, I'm talking about Isaiah. And so Isaiah was, uh, saw the, the reign of Uzziah, a good king, but the son of Uzziah, Jotham, was a wicked king. The son of Jotham, Ahaz, was another wicked king, true to his name, right? Ahaz. That's why when people, Ahaz talaga, something like that, right? However, Ahaz, his son was Hezekiah. And for some reason, for some reason, Hezekiah was one of the great kings of Judah. Not of the United Kingdom, but of the, of the divided kingdom of Judah. It says of him that there was no king bef like him before him during the divided kingdom. And there was no king like him after him. So he was, he was probably the best king of Judah. During the time of his father Ahaz, Ahaz set up pagan rituals and pagan worship all throughout the land of Judah. When Hezekiah started to reign, what he did was he tore down all the altars, all the pagan altars. But not only did he tear down the pagan altars, he would send priests to the different parts of Judah. And even sometimes over the border towards Israel. To call them back towards God. He had a, uh, uh, a spiritual revival. Not only did he reinstate the, reinstated the priest, he also brought back the Passover. Because during the time of Ahaz, the Passover was, ne was no longer observed. They were totally turning away from God. But because of Hezekiah. Now here comes Hezekiah, turning the people towards God once again. As a matter of fact, if you remember the bronze snake that Moses built in the wilderness, Moses built a bronze snake so that the people would be saved from, from uh, snake bites. And so God said, all you have to do, if you want to be saved from the, from the venom of the snakes, all you have to do is look at the bronze snakes. And so Moses built that and they took that to Israel with them. However, the people were now bowing down to, those bronze, to the bronze snake. They were worshiping after it. So this bronze snake is actually a national icon. It was, you know, you could say it's in the museum. People would visit it. People would look at it. And, you know, the, the curators would, would uh, uh, explain the history of the bronze snake to the next generation. But you know what Hezekiah did? He destroyed that bronze snake, even if it was a national treasure. He destroyed it because people were bowing down to it. So he, he, he swept reform all over the land. He was a good military strategist. During his time, it was like Solomon's time, of course, not, not as grand as Solomon. But during his time, economy, uh, politics, everything was stable. And then there was this point where in the Assyrian army, the superpower at that time, after defeating the northern kingdom of Israel, now they went to Judah. And now they are besieging Judah. And they want to destroy it. But here's what um, Hezekiah said in 2 Chronicles chapter 32, verse 8. I just want to show you this because this is not written in 2 Kings chapter 20. The life of Hezekiah, you can read it in Isaiah, you can read it in 2 Kings, and you can read it in 2 Chronicles. And here's what he said. He said, with him, with the Assyrian army, 
is an arm of flesh, but with us is the Lord our God to help us and to fight our battles. And the people took confidence from the words of Hezekiah, the king of Judah. And the story goes that because Hezekiah trusted in the Lord, God delivered the kingdom of Judah from the Assyrians. And God sent an angel in the camp of the Assyrians, and the angel killed 185,000 in the Assyrian army. And so the following day, the king of Assyria realized that his army has been decimated, and the rest of his army went back to Nineveh, the capital of Assyria. You can actually read the accounts in another uh, historical uh, books, like some, some uh, written by Josephus and Herodotus. But here's the thing. This thing happened, okay? And so Hezekiah saw this great miracle, and the one that we read a, a while ago happened after this siege. It says that in those days, Hezekiah became sick and was at the point of death. And Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amos, came to him and said to him, Thus says the Lord. Okay, thus says the Lord. So this is not just the doctor who said it. This is God who said it. How many of you would like to hear this from God? Set your house in order, for you shall die. I don't want to hear that from God. Amen? I want to hear from God. Rev, I'm going to bless you. Rev, I'm going to prosper you. If I'm sick, I want to hear from God. Rev, I'm, Rev, I'm going to heal you. But this is what Hezekiah heard. And this is not just coming from anyone. It's not coming from the pastor or the priest. It's not coming from the victory group leader. It's coming from God himself. Set your house in order. But I guess if you look at it, uh, I, I think that's, that's still part of God's mercy. At least God is giving him the opportunity to prepare the next generation. Set your house in order for you shall die. You shall not recover. But here's the amazing thing about Hezekiah. His faith is in the person of God. That God is a merciful God. That God is a loving God. That God is a compassionate God. And so Hezekiah turned his face to the wall and prayed to the Lord saying, Now, O Lord, please remember me. Remember how I have walked before you in faithfulness and with a whole heart and have done what is good in your sight. And Hezekiah wept bitterly. Lord, please remember me. And he wept bitterly. Understandable. Okay? If you were the one probably received the news, you would do likewise. He knew who to turn to. When the army of Assyria was besieging Jerusalem, he knew who to turn to. Now, personally, in his time of crisis, he knew who to turn to. Amen? I hope, as people of God, we know who to turn to. Not just during those times of, of, you know, corporate prayer, but even of personal prayer as well. And so God said to Isaiah, before Isaiah could leave, God said, go back to him. The word of the Lord came to Isaiah. Okay, the word of the Lord came to Isaiah. Turn back and say to Hezekiah, the leader of my people, thus says the Lord, the God of David, your father, I have heard your prayer. I have seen your tears. Behold, I will heal you. How many of you want to hear that from God? I will heal you. On the third day, you shall go up to the house of the Lord. And specifics, I will add 15 years to your life. Wow, 15 years. I will deliver you and this city out of the hand of the king of Assyria, and I will def defend this city for my own sake and the sake of my servant David. See, most of us, even if we feel like, you know, I, Hezekiah has received so much blessing, but all of us have received blessings, amen? All of us have seen the faithfulness of God. And all of us have seen the faithfulness of God towards others. But here's the thing. Could it be that one of the most successful kings of Judah, his rise was, man, amazing. Having a personal healing from God, having a personal de uh, de you know, redemption from God, not just for himself, but for his people. What do you think would drive him to his fall? 
what do you think? What are the things? We've seen the pride of, of, of Solomon. We've seen the, uh, the compromise of David. What do you think about Isaiah? What can we learn from his kingship? Because sometimes even if God shows us and, and gives us success after success after success, sometimes we can forget that he is the one in control. Sometimes it gets to our head. And so Hezekiah said to Isaiah, what shall be the sign that the Lord will heal me? Talk about segurista, right? I mean, God already told him, but here's what Hezekiah said, what shall be the sign? And you know what? For God, that's okay. God did not rebuke him for asking for a sign. What shall be the sign that the Lord will heal me and, what, and that I shall go up to the house of the Lord on the third day? And Isaiah said, this shall be the sign to you that from the Lord that the Lord will do the thing that he has promised. So there's a question for Hezekiah. Shall the shadow go forward 10 steps or go back 10 steps? They're talking about time. Shall the time advance or shall the time go back? Okay, whether it advances or goes back, Hezekiah will know this is the hand of the Lord. But here's what Hezekiah said. It is an easy thing for the shadow to lengthen 10 steps, to go forward. Rather, let the shadow go back 10 steps. And Isaiah the prophet called to the Lord, and he brought the shadow back 10 steps by which it had gone down on the steps of Ahaz. So remember this, God will add 15 years to his life. And remember this, the Assyrian army, an army that was so strong, mighty, and cruel, turned back from its siege from Jerusalem. In another account, when you look at the account of the, from the Assyrians themselves, they actually did not say that they were defeated. If you go to um, other accounts of the Assyrians uh, in the prism of Sennacherib, it says there that they, they besieged Jerusalem and then they left because Jerusalem paid them tribute. And so when you look at that, it seems like it's contradictory to what the Bible accounts are, but you have to understand this. Every siege that Assyria did during their time they were able to complete it and they destroyed the inhabitants. That's what they did. Only in this siege that they said, we besieged it and then we went back to our own place. They did not say that they got defeated. You know why? Because it's not really good for the ego of the king to say that I was not able to defeat my, my enemy and God worked for, you know, on behalf of them. So two miracles that have that, that I, I, Hezekiah has seen in his life. And guess what? Because of those miracles, it was broadcasted in CNN during that time. Now, the Babylonians got hold of this. They heard of this account. Now, remember, the superpower was Assyria. The junior power was Babylon. Okay? Kind of like now. Who's the superpower now? We don't know really, right? Okay, some say it's the U.S., some say it's China. Who knows? Maybe it's the Philippines. We just don't know it yet, okay? So here comes from the junior superpower because they've heard of the miracle. They've heard of, of the good things that God has done. And they wanted to know what it was at the time of Merodach Baladan, the son of Baladan, king of Babylon, sent envoys with letters and a present to Hezekiah, for he had heard, for he heard that Hezekiah had been sick. In the second Chronicles, it says this, and so in the matter of the envoys of the princess of Babylon, who had been sent to him to inquire about the sign. So whether that's the sign of the Assyrians leaving or the sign that, wow, time went back, the shadow went back. They wanted to know what is it about? They wanted to find out. But not only that, they also want Judah to be part of their alliance because they're brewing up an alliance of nations against Assyria. 
Remember, Babylon was a rising superpower. And it was an opportunity for Hezekiah to boast about his God. It was an opportunity for Hezekiah to say, you want to know about the sign? Because the sign has to point somewhere. And the sign is not about me. The sign is about the God whom I serve. That's what they were, the, the envoys of Babylon were doing in Judah. Okay? However, it was actually a way for God to test him, to know what was in his heart. Well, God already knows, so that Hezekiah will know what's in his heart. So what do you think? What do you think did Hezekiah do? Did he showcase the temple? Did he showcase the glory of the Lord? Here's what Hezekiah did in 2 Kings chapter 20, verse 13. And Hezekiah welcomed them, and he showed them all his treasure house. The silver, the gold, the spices, the precious oil, his armory. All that was found in his storehouses, there was nothing in his house and in all his realm that Hezekiah did not show them. What did Hezekiah boast about? He boasted about himself. They were looking for a sign, an opportunity to tell this junior superpower, probably an opportunity in your case to tell about your boss, about God when he asks you about something. And instead of telling him about God, you tell him about yourself. Well, it's really nothing, you know. It's just that I'm just that good. Have you heard of humble, humble brags? Do you do that in your Facebook? You know, I, I, seen, I saw this before. It says, praise God, okay? Praise God, I got an Hermes bag for only 225000 What a deal. But, praise God, okay? You know, humble brags are saying that, you know, uh, it's like posting something and saying that, you know, uh, I'm glad that this happened to me and it's not really about me, but really it's about you. It's about what you have. It's like when you do a selfie with your, with your Lamborghini and say, I never thought that traffic would be so bad with my Lamborghini in Manila. But thank God, I was able to arrive on time. Something like that, no? Now, if you're blessed, praise God. But please, Boast about your God, not about what you have. Because that's the first thing that we can learn from Hezekiah. We should boast about God's goodness instead of our accomplishments. Because sometimes we forget that our accomplishments is really about God's goodness. Sometimes we forget the reason where, why we got where we are is really because of God's favor and God working behind the scene even if we don't know it. That's actually Tita Patti and Tito Geno. Tito Geno had uh, angioplasty, 11 stents. It was a major surgery. And just like Hezekiah, it was also, it's like God gave him a second life. Hezekiah was given a second life. And just like Hezekiah, Tito Geno was given a second life. Okay, he was, he was uh, blessed by God with many more days in his life. And guess what did he do? What do you think did he do with that second life that he had? Well, he just continued what he usually does. He would make disciples. He would honor God. He attended the, the leader's convergence with his wife. He would bring people to the Lord, go through Victory Weekend. But you might say, wait a minute, that man is Mark? That's a dis someone that uh, Tito Geno discipled? But how come it's Tita Patti who's doing the baptism? Because of the surgery, uh, Tito Geno was not allowed to go into the water. But don't worry, that's his foot right there. <laughs> it's okay, he's there, okay? So that's his foot right there. And so he, again, uh, he had daily dialysis because of kidney failure. And then I think a month ago, he was brought to the hospital. And here's the amazing part. When he was brought to the hospital and Tita Patti was looking through his man bag 
for some uh, identification so that he can give it to the hospital staff. Here's what she saw. She said she saw a, an electronic Bible, a one-to-one -one booklet, and his passport. Talk about a Bible and a passport. Why do you think did Tito Geno bring his one-to-one -one booklet? Why do, you, why do you think did he have his Bible, his electronic Bible? Because even in the hospital, he was still sharing the Word of God. He was still sharing the Word of God. He was still discipling even the nurses at the hospital. It's an amazing thing. But you know what? I think... Three weeks ago or a month ago, he passed away. He did not make it. But the thing is this. He lived a life boasting about his God. Some of us, we've been given second chances. Some of us got sick, and then when we were healed, you know what we did? Instead of using that time for God's purpose, we used that time to eat all we can. Okay? We use that time, like, you know, well, I miss the seasick, I miss the, uh, what are the things that we eat that are not so healthy? The lechon, what else? The, actually, I'm sorry, because I don't eat unhealthy food. Okay, I'm trying to maintain my size 28 waistline. <laughs> just joking, I'm not size 28. Okay, I'm just size 29. Okay. <laughs> But what are we doing with the time that God has given us? What are we doing with Are we doing it for God's purpose and glory? Or are we just doing it so that we can have more, more, more? And once we have more, we can brag about our accomplishments. That's what Hezekiah did. Unfortunately, the man of God, the man of prayer, the man who has received so much favor from the Lord, forgot that it was all about God and not about him. Then he Isaiah the prophet came to King Hezekiah and said to him, what did these men say? And from where did they come? What for, and from where did they come to you? And Hezekiah said, they have come from a far country from Babylon. And because he failed to give honor to God, because he failed to understand that this is about God, Isaiah said to him, we have, what have they seen in your house? And he said, they have seen all that is in my house. There is nothing in my storehouses that I did not show them. Isaiah said to Hezekiah, hear the word of the Lord again. Hear the word of the Lord. A while ago when he was sick, what did God say? What did Isaiah say? This is what the Lord says. And again, here's what Isaiah says to him. Hear the word of the Lord. Hear the word of the Lord. Behold, the days are coming when all that is in your house and that which your fathers have stored up Till this day shall be carried to Babylon, nothing will be left, says the Lord. And some of your own sons who shall be born to you shall be taken away, and they shall be eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon. Everything that you've worked for will be taken. All the resources, all your success will be wiped away. Even your own children will be dishonored, castrated, eunuchs. And made into slaves. And what do you think did Hezekiah do? Will he once again face the wall, pray to God? Will he once again weep bitterly and ask God, Lord, forgive me, Lord. Please do not let this happen to me or to my family, to my next generation. Here is what Hezekiah said. He said to Isaiah, the word of the Lord that you have spoken is good. What? The word of the Lord that you have spoken is good for he thought, why not if there will be peace and security in my days? Wow. Can you believe that? How can that word be good? Because in his mind, well, as long as I'm not going to go through it, it will happen not to me, it will happen to my sons and my grandsons. And it's okay. Because I've enjoyed life. Given 15 years. 15 more years to live. And instead of looking forward. Instead of thinking and preparing the next generation. 
all Hezekiah could think about was self-preservation. And so a lesson for us, we should prepare the next generation instead of just thinking self-preservation. How many of you here are young? Okay, let me qualify what young is. <laughs> young is like me. Okay, how many are young? How many are younger? Great, okay. The young should prepare the younger. Amen? Because I don't want to say I'm old. I'm, I'm not really old. I'm just a bit fermented, if you want to. That's why last weekend, Friday and Saturday, I was just so amazed to see fathers who are willing to be prepared by God so that they can prepare the next generation. You know, one father said, first time that they joined and, and her daughter as well, and, and they were, <laughs> he was cooking pancakes. And after cooking pancakes, you know, the pancake color was like purple. Have you ever eaten a purple pancake and it's all just eggs and stuff, nothing, no ingre other ingredients? But here's what his daughter said, Dad, this is the best pancakes I've ever had. Because it's not about the pancakes. It's about the time spent together. And I, I saw fathers would pray for their children, bless their children, speak life and identity and destiny to their children. And I've realized there is hope for this nation, amen. There is hope because the people of God steps out in faith to trust God for the next generation. And there is hope. Pastor Jure was our speaker. And here's one of the things that I would not forget what he said. He said, our nation's future will greatly be more affected by what happens in our homes than who wins the elections tomorrow. Greatly more affected. What does that mean? If you and I, when in our homes we prepare the next generation, when in our homes we pray for them and speak life to them, when we disciple the future leaders, then even if the one who wins tomorrow is not your candidate, you can be sure of this. God is in control. Amen? You can be sure that there is hope for this nation. Fathers, mothers, what are we teaching the next generation? Because Hezekiah thought, it's okay as long as I'm okay. It really doesn't matter what happens. Did you know that the next king after Hezekiah was Manasseh? Manasseh is his son. Did you know how old Manasseh ascended to the throne? Twelve years old. Twelve years old, which means Manasseh was born during the time that God extended his life. Twelve years old. Do you know what Manasseh did? Everything that Hezekiah did, he destroyed it. He destroyed, you know, the Passover celebration. He put up pagan temples. But not only that, he went a step further than Ahaz. You know what he did? In the temple itself, inside, he set up pagan altars. Inside the temple of God. Simply because... Hezekiah did not look forward and did not think to prepare the next generation. And because of what Manasseh did, Manasseh, if Hezekiah is the, one of the great kings of Judah, there was no king before him and no king after him in terms of his accomplishments. Manasseh is, Manasseh is also like that. He was the worst king of Judah. There was no king before him and there was no king after him in terms of his wickedness the next generation. Let's boast about God, but let's not forget. Let the next generation boast about God as well. One of the things that Pastor Jure said that really hit me is this. We have to teach our children to seek God's purpose and to teach our children to hear from God's voice, not just our own voice. An amazing thing, one of the fathers said this. He said, yes, I, I received that word. And so now I have to teach myself to hear from God and not just from the voice of my wife. <laughs> it's a joke, okay? 
But here's the thing. Are we teaching the next generation to hear from God or just from other voices out there? Hezekiah's heart was proud. This is how God defined him during that time. Hezekiah's heart was proud, and he did not respond, respond to the kindness shown him. He became proud. Just like Saul became proud, just like David became proud also thinking that he can get away with things, just like Solomon became proud, and so Hezekiah also. But here's the thing, the greatest king that we can ever serve showed us the way. In Philippians chapter 2, it says here, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. But sometimes it's hard, no? It's hard because we understand that we should be people who are driven, people who have ambition. Ambition is okay. Selfish ambition is not. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves. Can you look at the person sitting next to you? Especially if that person is, you, is your wife. I hope this will really hit you hard. To value your wife above yourself. Can all the wives say amen? Amen. lakas talaga, halos. But I would also ask of the wives to value your husbands above yourselves. Amen? Not looking for your own interests, but each for, of you for the interests of others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Jesus Christ. Who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used for his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. The lessons that we've learned from Abimelech from Saul, from David, from Solomon, from Hezekiah, everything we see in the life of Jesus Christ. And here's what Jesus said, if you abide in me, if you grow with me, if you stay with me, you will bear fruit. I don't want us to go through this series and think that I have to do this, I have to do this because you will be frustrated. It's not in you. But when you abide in Christ and everything is in Him, and He is in you, you will see your lives bearing fruit. You will see your lives making personal sacrifices. You will see that you, you're going to be humble. You will see your life, and you will see your children and the people around you being affected by what God is doing in you because God did not just call you to be transformed, he also called you to work through you, that you will be a conduit of blessing. And sometimes when we say we are blessed to be a blessing, sometimes all we think about are the finances. No, you are going to be blessed. Humility, character, joy, peace, patience, love. And as you grow in that, guess what? You will be a blessing, especially to your family. And here's what Paul said that being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. We've been talking about kings. They rise and fall. And they would always want to go up, 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 up. I want to be great. I want to do great things. But you know what? The greatest king is the one who not only did he do the greatest deed, but he did it when we thought he was falling. When the world thought that this king of the Jews, he's not even, you know, he hasn't even taken that step towards the throne, and now he's up there on the cross like a criminal. And everybody thought that this king has fallen. And that's true because this king has fallen for us so that you and I we can rise for him. Amen? So I just want to pray today. I want to pray for the elections tomorrow. I want us to be at peace. One of the things that Pastor Steve said that gave peace to me is that he said, more than who you vote for, know why you vote for that person. It's really the why. It's a conscience vote. So let's be at peace. Whoever is the king or the president tomorrow, Jesus is still King of Kings. Amen? That's not going to change. 
But what will change is, are you going to enjoy His kingship? If you abide in Him, yes. If you don't, even if He blesses you so much, you will not enjoy the blessing if you are not in the King of Kings. Why don't we all stand? Father, we just commit to you our nation. God, tomorrow we will choose a new president. And I pray for my brothers and sisters. I pray, God, that, Lord, that this election, Lord, would, after this election, we would still stay united. Friends would still be friends. You know, family would still be family. I know that when I look at the news and even the Twitter feeds and the Facebook, it seems like it's a very divisive election, but we thank you that in Christ we can have unity. And I pray, Lord God, for your will to be done. I pray for your peace in our hearts. We thank you that you are the God who will never fall because you have already fallen for us. It's already done. And in you, we can experience glorious days ahead. We can be excited for what you will do in this country because uh, the hope of this nation is in you and in our homes as well. If you're a family here, or if you're with your family, can you hold hands? I just want to pray for every marriage and every family in this place. Lord, we thank you for every marriages. We just speak a blessing of goodness and faithfulness. We speak a blessing of love, of joy, of peace and growth and unity, Lord God. Lord, we declare that no one will be able to break our marriages in the name of Jesus. We declare, Lord God, that we will have many great memories, Lord, in our marriages. We declare, Lord God, that if things are not going well today, we just declare your goodness in our marriages today. We renounce every spirit of failure in the name of Jesus. We renounce every spirit of anger, Lord God, in the name of Jesus. Every spirit of division and faithlessness, we renounce it in Jesus' name. And we declare, Lord God, that our families will grow and stay strong. And Lord, we just pray for healing. Heal our hearts, Lord, for every offenses that we have received from our families. God, right now, we just declare forgiveness. We just declare mercy and humility. And God, we are amazed and excited to see our children grow, to see them fulfill your purpose in their generation. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you.